I'm Neil Woodford Kit Guru. After we posted my review of the Zalman CMPS 20X cooler on Kit Guru a few days ago, the traffic went absolutely crazy, really surprisingly good. And this was a complete puzzle to Kit Guru. We rapidly realized it's because no one else seems to have reviewed this cooler, in, or there's one German guy who did it about a month ago. But in the English language, we can't find any other reviews of this cooler. A few things immediately became apparent. So we got loads of traffic, loads of thumbs up, very few thumbs down, loads of comments. Comments are really good, and almost all of them were engaging with the product. So the things that became obvious from the off are Zalman has got some fans out there. Noctua, who used for the comparison, Noctua's got lots of fans out there. So that's good. We've got two engaged audiences. And then there were various questions, which were pointing out I'd missed some very basic uh, points in the video. To which my response generally was, well, if you go to kitguru.net, you'll see on the written page, we've got things like the full spec of the cooler and such like. It still gets to me, but so many YouTube watchers do not comprehend that KitGuru is primarily a website. Go over there, there's photos, there's words, there's all sorts. Anywho, to cover those basic points again, the towers of this cooler incline together. In the video, it looks like the RAM is pushing the towers kind of like that. Not so. As you can see, they're kind of like that. So we didn't have a problem in the video with clearance between the cooler and the memory. It was all quite close and you can move the fans up and down a bit if you want. Uh, and I did do that to make sure that everything was clearing the RAM. But if you thought the RAM was being interfered with or the RAM is interfering with the cooler, not so. Also, the fans, they are slightly quirky. They use this uh, attachment system of Zalman's own. So these metal uh, bars, I suppose, rather than the regular wire clips, they hook onto these two plastic uh, doohickeys and then they swing into place. That's quite good in that you don't have to do that horrible wire clip, pull them around the uh, sharp fins thing. But even so, you do have to take care. It does mean the odds you're going to fit other fans to this cooler or fit these fans to another cooler, most unlikely. So treat it as an assembly. Uh, one or two people are asking what happens if you try different fans. And, and apart from the other side, I think that doesn't make a lot of sense in that, yes, it's good for normalizing parts. On the other hand, you buy an assembly, you want to see how the assembly performs. If Zalman's providing you know, lousy fans and a good cooler or vice versa, well, it's a package you're paying for. And then we come to fan noise. I didn't mention it at all in the video, not one bit. And the reason I didn't mention it was because it wasn't a factor. However, you couldn't know that, you're not psychic. So the fans on this cooler were normalized at 1000 RPM. The fans on the Noctua D15 and also on the Deep Cool were normalized at 1000 RPM. And then in performance, I went for 1500. And they sounded so similar. I didn't think to mention it, stupid. So uh, there's a chart over on kickguru.net and the figures are there. I'll let you be the judge about audio levels from the fans. So we've got the Noctua D15 with both fans running at a nominal 1000 RPM. It's actually about 1020. We have the intake on this side exhausting to the IO pan. You'll notice during the testing in the B-roll, the configuration is actually the other way around. On an open test bench, it just doesn't make a difference. I have tried it both ways. I've got two marks on the table at half a meter from the nearest fan. Let's hear what the intake sounds like. And now the exhaust. This is the configuration for the overclock CPU. So with the CPU running at 4.25 gigahertz, the fans are running at a nominal 1500 RPM. It's actually about 1470. First the intake. And now the exhaust. Switching over to Zalman, I've got the dual fans running at a nominal 1000 RPM. It's actually 1020. So once again, let's go with the intake side. And the exhaust. To my ears, both the Noctua and Zalman are really quiet at those speeds. And finally, the Zalman fans running at 1500 RPM nominal. It's actually 1470. So intake.
and exhaust. Hardware compatibility. This cooler does not go on Threadripper. It is a small base cooler in that Threadripper is enormous. But everything apart from Threadripper, you're fine. However, somebody else asked the question about LGA775. And that's Core 2 Duo, isn't it? That's out of the arc. Uh, no, is the short answer there. And I don't think 1366 either. So LGA115X and uh, LGA2066 and X99, they're all fine. On the AMD side of things, you're good. So when I use the shorthand, every platform that I care about, every platform that I'd consider putting a 70 pound cooler on, yes. However, no, not everything, not Threadripper. We've seen a number of cooler companies bring out specific Threadripper models. They have an enormous base and it's necessary. Threadripper is big. Having seen the interest in the Zalman cooler, my thought was, well, park the next job I had scheduled and instead try it out on, for example, this ASRock X299 with Core i9-7980XE. Yes, that's seventh gen, but 18 cores, that should be fun. Um, I don't have the 9000 series anymore. I think Luke's got that. And I never got the Cascade Lake X because Luke did that launch review. But nonetheless, that 7th gen uh, 18 core processor, that's an animal, that would give it a workout. And by the way, I hope this was a joke, but it might not have been. One of the comments on the video referred to packaging. I said something like Intel packaging sheds heat very poorly, whereas a Ryzen 3000 is absolutely brilliant. I responded to that comment and I may have got the wrong end of the stick because they referred to packaging as in box. And of course, when I say packaging, I'm talking about heat spreader and the tim. And they may have been trolling me, they may have been having a joke, just in case there's a real big crosswire, Intel packaging, I'm talking about the actual CPU, not the box it comes in. Anywho, I thought to myself, right, let's break out an Intel platform. And then among other things, we can look at things like uh, compatibility with the cooler and say quad channel memory, which is then on both sides of the processor socket. Uh, do you have clearance? And the short answer is if you're using something like Vengeance LPX, yes, if you're using tool memory, not so much. Uh, however, a number of the comments below the video have been querying performance. They have been saying there was no way on God's green earth that the Noctua D15 was beaten so comprehensively by the Zalman. And this wasn't backed up by fact. The problem is, as I say, as far as I can work out, I'm the only person to have reviewed this uh, cooler and we've done it on Ryzen 3000. That other chap I mentioned, he did it on a very, very old AMD platform. So nobody's saying have a link to this review here where someone's tried this cooler on whatever processor and they're getting these figures, yours don't match up. The other thing is this, Noctua D15 is an antique. It's very, very old. It dates from mid or late 2014 and it was an update to the D14. It's a much loved cooler. It's very good. But the fact of the matter is it's been around a long time. And as I said, I think in that original video, it predates Ryzen 3000 by years. I don't think Noctua had any concept of desktop processors with 12 and 16 cores and 24 and 32 threads when they developed that cooler. Why would they? I mean, it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even dreamt of. So the fact that Zalman in my testing beat Noctua by up to six degrees, I was impressed by that. But it didn't shock me. And I didn't think much of it. But I thought before I get into testing on Intel, I need to run those tests again. I returned to the test platform, which I'd only been using the previous day, and broke out the same coolers. And I found very little. Ambient temperature had dropped by one to two degrees, and I saw exactly that differential with the uh, coolers when I retested over the weekend. So that didn't really help me, did it? The numbers had dropped, and just to pick up on another point, on a different comment, uh, I'd referred to uh, absolute temperatures, by which I meant as opposed to uh, relative stroke delta temperatures. As in, if I say it ran at 80 degrees C, I don't mean it was 80 degrees over ambient, it was 80 degrees. This person quite correctly, but somewhat pedantically pointed out, I'm not talking Kelvin, I'm working in Celsius, therefore it's not absolute temperatures, is it? It's like, okay, fair enough. In which case, let's call them true temperatures or dead temperatures. Anyway, that. 
So temperatures had dropped by one to two degrees and that was no help whatsoever. And then I remembered when I received the Zalmans, in particular this 20X, I got in touch with Noctua to say, I've received the world's best cooler. I didn't tell them what it was. Do you fancy sending me a D15 for comparison? And they said, yes, absolutely. Because Noctua has great confidence in their products. They are, they're very good for providing samples for review. So the D15 rocked up and I remembered I still had a D15 on the shelf, which is probably a couple of years old and has probably been used two or three times. It's effectively new. Swapping them over is dead easy. You leave the mounts in place, remove the middle fan. Use the provided screwdriver as mentioned before to go for the two screws. Off with the one, on with the other. Bingo. With the two D15s swapped over, I now found temperatures compared to my original testing dropped by four to five degrees. When you subtract that one or two degrees change in ambient, that means the gap between the Zalman 20X and the Noctua D15 closed by three or four degrees. I mean, it's significant. There's no doubt about that. The thing is, Zalman 20X still outperforms Noctua D15. However, the margin is much reduced. Nonetheless, 20X in terms of performance wins. The obvious question is why does this D15 perform better than this D15 on that Ryzen 9 3900X? And the answer is I don't know. To my eyes, these coolers look identical. The cold plates both look in good nick. I can't see any obvious marks. They don't appear to be concave. Perhaps this just happens to match that CPU better. Then again, perhaps the question should be what variants do you get between D15s or any coolers? Thinking back, I've never taken two of the same cooler in the past and tested them back to back. It might even be both D15s are absolutely fine, and this 20X just happens to be stellar. I honestly don't know. What I do know is 20X outperforms D15 slightly. And as I said in that first video, cooler performance is not the be all and end all. You've got fitment, you've got compatibility. You might even have the question of aesthetics. Do you like the Noctua Brown? Do you like the copper look on the fins? Do you hate the fact the towers on the Zalman spring together? There are lots of things to consider, including the fact Zalman has RGB, Noctua does not. Originally, there was no plan to do a second video about the Zalman. And then the question arose of, well, how might these coolers perform on the Intel testbed? And then as you've seen, the entire thing went sideways and we've gone down this particular rabbit hole. One thing I did get the chance to do is to address another of the questions that had uh, popped up a few times on the uh, thread below the video, which was relating to a uh, fan installation. When I was shooting B-roll for the video with the Noctua D15, I installed both fans on the one tower. And a few people picked up on this and said, huh, that's going to affect performance. That was purely for B-roll, that wasn't for testing. But the thought occurred, well, yeah, perhaps I had done it during testing and just completely missed it. So I went back and I tested in both configurations with uh, one fan on this tower, one fan on this tower, and then with both fans on this tower, it made no difference whatsoever. In actual fact, it appears, and I don't quite understand this, to help cooling by about 0.1 degrees, and that's absolutely within the margin of error, so forget about that. Uh, so clipping both fans on this tower as opposed to one on each makes absolutely no difference. One thing that did make a dramatic difference just as you'd expect was inverting the middle fan so that it was blowing forward while this fan was blowing backwards, i.e. they were fighting each other. In actual fact, the difference was around about seven or eight degrees. One thing it did, however, do was slow the fan speeds. I could see them dropping from 1500 RPM to 1350. So that was absolutely noticeable. While it's conceivable, you could install the center fan blowing against the outer fan and thus they're fighting and that hurts temperatures badly. You would, if you're keeping an eye on it, notice the difference in fan speed. So yes, that's certainly possible. That might in some very unfortunate circumstances be a factor. Thankfully here, I'm confident not the case. To wrap this up, these two D15s do not perform identically and they are both beaten by this Zalman 20X, but only by a little bit. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, hit the bell button, subscribe, return. I don't think there's going to be a third video on the Zalman 20X, but you never know.